this is a spoiler. You can't listen you know. to this and not have spoilers. Laura, this is your book. Do you, would you like to take an adventure? All right. So, uh, yeah, this, so this is the House of the Dead by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And I have a summary to make, but I will say a quote before I start. The first quote that I was thinking of was he said, it was a long time ago. It all seems to me like a dream. And that may go toward a little bit as to why this book is not as good as his other books. But anyway, in terms of a summary, it's not huge because there is literally no plot other than he goes and then he leaves. <laughs> he goes and then he's freed. It's his memoir of his, of his time in the Siberian labor camp. And he was sent there after being arrested for participating in the Petrushevsky Circle, which was a progressive literary circle dedicated to discussing uh, Western philosophy. And these are, at the time, I think it was Nicholas the I, I think, the second, one of the two, <laughs> ended up arresting the members of this group because he feared they would contribute to a possibly evolving revolution against the government. So then Dostoevsky and his comrades were arrested and then subjected to a mock execution. And then he was sent to Siberia for four years. The narrator, Alexander and Petrovich Goryanchev, <laughs> I wondered who would be the first yeah. to try. Goryanchikov, Goryanchikov. But I'll just go with Alexander. <laughs> he was there for 10 years, and it was at some point reduced. But that, again, he is his fictional. This is fiction. This is, um, it's based on true events, but a lot of, honestly, I think more of it is not fiction than is fiction. But I think that in order to write this memoir, uh, Dostoevsky had to put it in terms of fiction in some way. I think it was such a horrible experience for him personally that he needed that kind of distance that fictionalizing the narrator gave him. So anyway, we meet the narrator, Alexander, and he, as I said, he's uh, Dostoevsky's fictional self. And we learn about the prison camp. We learn about how it works. We meet the inmates who Dostoevsky finds admirable or frightening about people who committed murder without any sense of regret of any kind. And I think that really ruined Dostoevsky on many levels, upset him deeply. So what I've done partly in going into this, since this is generally more of a experience of observation, well, observation and the writing that he did is more of an observation about his surroundings, the other inmates. Obviously, there's a number of fascinating philosophical statements he makes. But I think the thing that jumped out at me mostly about this book was how not good it was and how it really departs from Dostoevsky's incredible talent. And I think it's because it was his life, an experience in his life that was just devastating. And I think that I think writers have problems writing about very painful experiences in their lives. Not all writers, but many. And I think that that's what contributes to the quality of this book, how it can be kind of a chore to get through because it's so difficult what he's experiencing becomes like we're in the Siberian camp. We're, we're in prison. Anyway, I wanted to read two quotes that I picked out that I feel say a lot about this book and Dostoevsky's experience there. First one is, tyranny is a habit which may be developed until at last it becomes a disease. I declare that the noblest nature can become so hardened and bestial that nothing distinguishes it from that of a wild animal. Blood and power intoxicate. They help to develop callousness and debauchery. The mind then becomes capable of the most abnormal cruelty, which it regards as pleasure. The man and the citizen are swallowed up in the tyrant, and then a return to human dignity, repentance, moral resurrection becomes almost impossible. Part of this, uh, that comes from his discussion about, which I feel is the most important part of this book, is about the executioners, the men who were in charge of essentially doing the flogging. That is so barbaric and it's so brutal. 
I found it fascinating what it would be like to be the person who does that kind of punishment and be the person, obviously, who receives it. This is my next quote about the executioners. Executioners enjoy a leisured existence. They have money to travel in comfort and drink vodka. They derive most of their income from presents slipped into their hands by condemned prisoners before execution. When they have to deal with a convict who is rich, they fix a sum to be paid in proportion to the victim's wealth and will sometimes exact 30 rubles or more. The executioner has no right to spare his victim, and he does so at the risk of his own back. But for a suitable present, he will agree not to strike too hard. He almost always receives what he asks, for in the event of a a refusal, he will flog without mercy, as indeed he has the right to do. He may sometimes demand a large sum from a poor man. Then all the victim's relatives bestir themselves. They bargain, try to beat him down, and implore his leniency. But woe betide if they fail to satisfy him. In such a case, the superstitious fear inspired by the executioner stands him in good stead. I've been told the most wonderful things, that an executioner can strike in such a way that the victim will not feel the least pain and without leaving a scar. Even when he has been bribed not to whip too severely, he administers the first stroke with all his might. It is his custom. He continues with less severity, especially when he has been paid handsomely. I do not know why this is done. It may be in order, as it were, to prepare the condemned for the succeeding blows, which will appear less painful by comparison, or it may be intended to frighten the criminal so that he may understand with whom he has to deal, or it may may be no more than vanity to display the executioner's own strength. In any case, he is pleased with himself before an execution and conscious of his power and vigor. He is the central figure of the drama. The public admires him and is filled with terror. Accordingly, it is not without satisfaction that he cries out to his victim, Now then, you're for it! Traditional and fatal words preceding the first blow. It is difficult to imagine a human being degraded to such a point. I think that the whole section on the executioner, which is really the part that jumped out to me the most, could be a metaphor for this whole book, for his whole experience, for the experience of prisoners, the experience of being a convict and having your entire sense of freedom or your entire freedom just destroyed and what comes out of it. Being a convict and being in prison is not just the only punishment you're going to receive. You're going to be abused by the guards and the people within the, who run the prison. But the last thing that jumped out at me was that he said at one point that there was no one, none of the inmates, none of the prisoners who expressed any sense of remorse for what they did, anything about their moral breakdown, nothing. Anyway, on an up note, I think what's fascinating about reading this book is that it teaches you about more about Dostoevsky than the book in and of itself. Anyway, that's my 300 cents. Thank you. I would just like to throw in quickly that I thought that the whole book, but especially the stuff about the executioner, disturbing. But I actually saw it as a metaphor for living in society. Basically, the executioner is who we all face every day. And not to downplay how awful prisoners are treated, were treated, the horrible corrections, in quotes, system that we have, you know, in the United States. I always try and take a step back and just see, is this, you know, is he just, is he talking about life in general? And well, yeah, (laughs) because most of the time it sucks and life is a flogging. So that's, I just wanted to throw that in since you were, since you were discussing that, that metaphor. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that you make. Oh, well, I mean, and let me say too that like I, it was longer than I thought and all that or whatever. And we were supposed to have a short read, but basically, uh, you know, it was Dostoevsky. I hadn't heard of this book. And so whenever we recommended, I was like, Oh, House of the Dead. I wonder if that's, it sounds kind of like a cheap thriller. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, and, and then, and then I'm like, Oh, okay, great. Well, I'm in good hands. And, uh, you know, and it, and it certainly was very interesting. And there were so many characters that, just seem to be if I mean, like you were saying, I think, Laura, there's a blend between fiction and reality and where's where. And there's just so many interesting characters that are too real to be true. Well, I am aware that on the whole, the characters that you meet were actually the men that he met in reality. It seemed like I mean, part of the dashed expectations a little bit was that for, you know, for me, this is, uh, I mean, it's Dostoevsky, but it's a different sort of style than what I was used to from him, having read Notes from the Underground and parts of the Brothers Karamazov and The Gambler and some other stuff. But 
This is a much more sociological sort of uh, book. It's not as plot driven and it's less overtly philosophical than some of the other stuff. And so the emphasis that I'm used to seeing from him wasn't there, but there were a lot of interesting things once I sort of adjusted my perspective to exploring the terrain of this prison and the way that the interactions between the prisoners uh, and the guards and the, each other and the animals all sort of had this really intricate dynamics to them. That was uh, that was what sort of jumped out at me and made the book interesting. And it, from the outside, you might think of this prison, if you had no experience in this kind of thing, as a place where just, you know, these degenerates were probably going to go and just claw each other to death. And, you know, it's just going to be this brutal thing. But they quickly see that they develop a way of life and a system of uh, dealing with each other. And there's brutality, certainly, but there's also kindness. There's also all of the normal elements of life, like Mary said, you know, there's there's a complexity and a richness to what goes on that it, it's a little village, right? Yeah, I found that my, I was trying to find quotes that I liked yesterday. I found that my favorite part was Christmas, when basically people were, the people in the prison were excited to be alive for a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that, and I enjoyed reading about that. But the other, the other thing that really struck me was how visceral. I mean, it's still def, it's definitely my least favorite Dostoevsky, but there's still that palpable, visceral power that he has in his writing. So I was just itchy and nauseated when he <laughs> talked about like the dressing gown at the hospital. It's like stop. <laughs> You know, lying in hay, it, you know, that those kinds of things. It's just like, uh, killing me here. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Part of that might have been too, right? That like for us now, this is a sort of historical document, but I think maybe at the time when it was published, it was more of an expose. Would that be right? I've heard this is uh, some of the this is the first Russian prison literature, if not uh, some of the first in depth literature on prison life. So we have this to, to thank for Oz. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, see him in the credits. <laughs> I'd agree they're mostly, um, it, it's not as connected as Dostoevsky's other works. It's mostly vignettes. But some of the vignettes are powerful and pointed. I mean, I'm thinking of, I can't even read my own handwriting here, but Balodkin, the officer who shot the German, he thought he was stealing his wife. There is the Akulka's hu husband where he pretty much murders his wife because his best friend is tormenting her. Uh, there was the, the arbitrary killing of his dog by the tanner for his skin and him just casually telling him that's what he did. <laughs> There's the setting the eagle free. There's a bunch of really, really good vignettes in here, but I agree with your assessment, Laura, that it, it probably was too close to home and too real and he was just trying to get these thoughts out. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was hard for him. It was. I thought the, the eagle especially, the eagle part was especially beautiful in that they had had this common innocent goal that had uh, an innocence involved in it, but it was it's a a fierce innocence, right? You know, you don't fuck with eagles, <laughs> 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 it, uh, you know, like wounded animals. It's a bad idea to fuck with wounded animals, and especially something as as powerful as an eagle. And then they were disappointed when he didn't look back. You know, the the whole like, anthropomorphizing, like, wait, he didn't appreciate that? No, <laughs> of course he didn't. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, Nathan, uh, and anybody who's read a bunch of Cormac McCarthy, if some of that animal stuff jumped out at you as uh, reminiscent or, well, I mean, this is prior to his work, of course. It reminded me of the way he deals with animals. Maybe Dostoevsky was an influence on him. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because I mean, in, in his, you always get the sense that there's, it's not really animal, the animal kingdom is just more of like this kingdom of beings anyway in Cormac McCarthy. It's like the, the horse is equally a monster as the man riding it and would kill. And, you know, it's kind of been, you know, like a, a born into blood. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot going on about animal minds. I mean, honestly, like, I mean, we're talking about this as like a first prison literature and that it, it really, I've read other things, right? So, I mean, people will be familiar with the Shawshank Redemption, but you see the same things, like how the prison itself is a character because it's not any of the men alone that go there. It's how they're commonly broken in this community. Actually, there's this bit on a, it's the one where the Cormac McCarthy in the border trilogy, he goes across the border. Uh, 
guess it's the crossing and he goes to get his brother or, and then he's in a prison for a short amount of time. And it's pretty hellacious. And you also get this vision of how these men are conducting themselves. The hardest people. I don't know. The men in this story are really what I'm holding on to. There's so many, Cesar, you laid out a bunch of good ones, but there's, you know, hundreds of these guys and each one of them are really, really interesting. I think of all the professions that they have, gilding and harness making and, and, and all of this. And they don't look like killers. I guess I had a lot of stereotypes in my head going into what I thought a Siberian work camp would be. And it was surprisingly more monstrous than I thought, but also more humane. Although I was, I have to say, I was a little bit put off by how lightly they, oh yeah, he killed his wife. Like there were a couple of guys in there who killed their wives and it was like, whatever. It was a misfortune. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, really? Yeah. Screw you. Yeah, well, let's say that, that I mean, the, the, the narrator character, I mean, we've talked a little bit about, like, the links between the worlds here, you know, Dostoevsky and then the fictional character, but this is a manuscript found from a suicide, right? Or no, he just died. He died, he was sick. Well, he was basically a suicide, though. And he finished this document. He didn't seek help, yeah. Certainly didn't try and save his own life, let's put it that way. He didn't mm. do anything to promote his own health. I was going to ask you guys about that because like Frankenstein and maybe some other stuff we've read, that is a frame narrative, but it's only barely one. I mean, it's only what a few paragraphs into the story that he moves on to Alexander Petrovich's uh, story and it never returns to the original narrator. I don't think, does it? No, it doesn't. No, it sets it, it sets it up for a failure in a sense because you know you're reading the prison memoirs uh, that end with him getting out of prison, but you already know beforehand that his life is be shitty because he <laughs> and he dies afterwards. Yeah, well, his life beforehand is interesting too because you get the sense that whatever you're getting ready to read had haunted him until the end. So there's a way in which the work hasn't been finished yet as you're reading, even though you know where he's going to end up. That that first little introduction where you get Alexander and you see that he's you know really good with a child, but really distasteful and distrustful of people in general and is a misanthrope. And one of the things that it said was that as he had conversations with people, they would find themselves at their turn to respond or something or midway through the conversation. And they didn't know why, but they wanted to get out of it. This guy was putting off this vibe, this energy that was outwardly polite, but they could just tell he was like roiling on the inside with like just wanting to get out of there. Like they could feel him scratching under his skin. And I, I wonder how much of that has to do with the prison or the kind of men that end up. And it's not just, I'm not supposing that as Fyodor's Dostoevsky's example, I think proves, but there is a kind of gravity to this place with certain kinds of people. And it's very interesting what it catches. He was, he, he seemed to me to be pretty open when he was in prison to new characters. He seemed to have a much more open way about him. I couldn't quite figure out what it was after he got out of prison that turned him into a misanthrope. So was there an indication for anyone else? No, maybe it was just having been there. I think maybe what was mentioned is also the character in the book, and I believe this mirrors Dostoevsky's own experiences. Uh, they were, he was a nobleman, and uh, he didn't fit in with the rest of the prisoners, and he was permanently, doubly so, almost alienated due to that fact. One of my favorite lines was just uh, at the end of the book when there was almost a prisoner mutiny due to the uh, crappy food. <laughs> and the character sort of thought about joining the mutiny, but the the regular prisoners told the noble guys to get the hell out of here. Like, what are you doing? And Petrovich is talking to his supposed buddy afterwards. He, he's saying that he should have helped. He should have, you know, showed solidarity. You know, we're all comrades. And the response is, oh, I say, are you our comrades? He asked with unfeigned astonishment. And that kind of like just hammers home to, uh, to Petrovich how he's permanently apart no matter what he ever does can't even work with the regular people. He can't show solidarity. He can't talk to them. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And he's permanently cast out of his role as a, you know, a nobleman gentleman when he gets out. He's a, he's a tutor for in a small town. He's kind of lost his place in the world. But that, that, I mean, that was his choice. It seemed to me that it was his choice to stay there, that it was his choice to do the things that he did. I, he I hear what you're saying, Cesar. I feel like, yeah, it's, but he just seemed so much more open when he was actually in prison than when he got out. And I I was looking for some some incident or, you know, well, maybe it's just the whole 10 years or whatever it was that wore on him and, and then there was no way for him to actually be in society again. But he never treated anyone in prison the way that he treated the people in the town afterward. Yeah, I, I wonder about, so I hadn't really thought about it. 
what had turned him this way. It kind, you know, I, I guess I accepted it as a natural arc. What was this guy like before? He was very open in prison, but I, I wonder about that as a kind of, you have to do that to get by. You know, you're curious and you've got your eyes open and you're looking out. And if you're maybe misanthropic, you'll perk up a little bit uh, at these guys. And it, and it, like, it's not a really big deal to be a misanthrope either, I think, in this universe, because it, it mentioned that a lot of the men were. Or it's just a, thi- a thing that people said in the 19th century of other people, or uh, Dostoevsky said of other people, I think. I'm not sure that it was a huge character turn so much as maybe just we didn't see it exhibited before the prison or what he was like before he murdered his wife. But you saw how he absolutely loved that other, the young guy who, I think he was uh, Muslim, who slept next to him or head to head with him, and whose, oh, yeah. whose brothers um, were always looking out for him. Is that Luca? Yeah, I probably. Sorry, I didn't write down any of the names. Yeah, and then he yelled at him one time, though, I think. That was the guy who helped him with his, um, who was basically his his servant. Oh, yeah, that's right. If it weren't for the time, I would have said that he was in love with him, this one character, who was just the embodiment of sweetness at the prison. I think that he ironed things for him and stuff. I don't know. But anyway, he slept with it, basically, with it, you know, touching heads with this guy. And he obviously loved him. He was very open. The guy was not of his class. The, you know, he was not even of his same faith, you know, not of the same world at all. Well, there's no really um, a spiritual awakening or anything that, that Petrovich goes through or sort of learns. I'm looking at that quote here. There is no denying that the people are morally ill with a grave, although not a mortal malady, one to which it is difficult to assign a name. May we call it an unsatisfied thirst for truth. The people are seeking eagerly and untiringly for truth and for ways that lead to it, but hitherto they have failed in their search. After the liberation of the serfs, this great longing for truth appeared among the people, for truth perfect and entire, and with it the resurrection of civic life. There was a clamoring for a new gospel, new ideas and feelings became manifest, and a great hope rose up among the people, believing that these great changes were re- precursors of a state of things which never came to pass. Mary, I see your point with that particular prisoner. He did say something. He said this, the reader will, reader will now understand why in those early days I was at a loss to know how I should ever manage to get on with such people. I foresaw that such incidents would often recur. This was about when he was out working. Remember, he was working on that ship. Remember, they went to that ship in the harbor. And his experience there was that he said he felt like he was always in the way of people. He says, I was told to get out of the light and I was generally abused by people, by the other inmates. He went on to say, I foresaw that such incidents would often occur, but I resolved not to alter my line of conduct in any way, whatever the result might be. I had decided to live simply and intelligently without manifesting the least desire to be on familiar terms with my fellow prisoners, but also without repelling them if they sought my company, to appear indifferent to their hatred and their threats, and to pretend as far as possible not to notice them. Such was my plan for I realized from the outset that they would despise me if I adopted another course. This may have been at work throughout the whole time he was there, even if he did get close with that young man that you're talking about, Mary. That may have been what was sort of in the back of his soul throughout this whole experience, to not get familiar with these people and to be indifferent. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. This reminds me a lot more of Shawshank Redemption now that I'm thinking about it. I mean, well, except that he didn't murder his wife, for real. Uh, yeah, but, but then again, maybe it would have been untoo sympathetic. Maybe maybe Stephen King cribbed House of the Dead. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think there's anything <laughs> to that. He cribs a lot. Well, you know, there's that part at the end when Morgan Freeman gets out and uh, he's working in, you know, his first job since then. And he asks his boss if he can go to the bathroom. And the guy's like, look, you know, you don't need to ask me. Just go. Just go. And he, he tries to go to the bathroom and he can't. His bladder's shy because no one gave him permission. And I always thought that was the most poignant part of the book because uh, it just really cleverly demonstrated how how deeply that psychology of situation penetrates into who you are. You know, your your bodily reflexes. It, it, it's not something he would have chosen. And now it's not something he can choose consciously to do or not do. It's just reflexive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And in this story, 
story, there's that aged guy who's leaving and feels, what is it called whenever you want to stay with your keeper? Stockholm Syndrome. So, you know, that's the same thing that happened to right. the librarian in the Shawshank Redemption, right? Like he wants to, you know, he's doesn't want to get out, but he's out now. And he's not been out and, you know, and now he's old. He doesn't know, he doesn't how, know to do how to that. do that. Yeah. And so the yeah. same thing. Now, you know, and these men aren't, it's not quite like in America, I don't guess, where you could have been in jail for 15 for a crime that you committed for, and, you know, be there for life. You know, here at least, you know, most of these people are men and they're going to be here for a while, but you can do 20 years. You can do a, a double term or a triple term, apparently. Yeah. I thought of a few things that we'd read. Um, waiting for Godot was another one because so much of this is waiting, right? And along the way of sort of longing for freedom, longing for it to be over, you know, it just becomes a daily lifestyle and you have that illusion of freedom. You know, it's, this was sort of uh, maybe a part of, to me of them letting the eagle go too. It's like you have that idea of freedom, but it's such a separate thing from the actual freedom. And the illusion is sort of what gets you through, right? Ideal becomes part of your day-to-day life, but then, you know, what what you actually do with it, you know, what your life is going to be like, you, you only suppose about it all being over. I don't think that you're ever free after you've entered prison. I mean, I don't even think you're ever can, free, period. Well, period, <laughs> but certainly we could say that. We can have we can have a long discussion about that. That's fine. But I certainly think that this exacerbates that. If you enter a situation where you're physically confined and then you leave, and like we saw with the Morgan Freeman character in Shawshank Redemption and what happened to Alexander here, even though the, the shackles come off your wrists and your, your ankles, do they ever really? Get this. Uh, so this is from, uh, this is what I think is interesting. It says, uh, it is acknowledged neither prisons, hulks, or any system of hard labor ever reformed a criminal. These forms of chastisement only punish him and reassure society against the offenses he might commit. Confinement, regulation, and excessive work have no effect but to develop in these men profound hatred, a thirst for forbidden enjoyment, and frightful oh, yeah. recalcitration. I think that says a lot. I think it's an open secret yeah, about, you know, um, jail systems and even, you know, the death penalty, what we think its effect is or what the myth about it is. But really, it's just a lack of alternatives. What's the system for? Is it punitive or is it? People say it, right? Yeah, but it can't be true. It feels like an open secret that it used to be that you go to prison and there's some idea of reform it. But where would you get that from now? I mean, even I, I, I think they made mention that the prisoners were branded in this book. I'm not sure if that was every single one. They were on the foreheads. Yeah, that was uh, po- uh, that was also in the 19th century going back to Blood Meridian. You'll remember Toad Vine had, I think it was yeah. H, T and F branded into his head. And then with, you know, with what you read, uh, there was also part of how the prisoners feeling that uh, having done their time felt that they adequately remunerated society for the supposed ills they caused them. So they were supposed to be on even footing having done their time. But of course, that's never the case. Yeah, let me just pick up from there because that's exactly it. I mean, it says, yeah, after you've done it, they feel like it's good in their own eyes. But everyone will acknowledge that there are acts everywhere and always, no matter what legal system, that are beyond doubt criminal and should be regarded as long as that man is man. So even once you do get you know rid of it, you still carry it around um, as a social mark. Yeah, that made me think of this, which I was looking for earlier. This quote, it would seem indeed that during all those years, I should have been able to detect some indication, however fugitive, I don't know if that's right, of some regret of some moral suffering from his co-prisoners. I positively saw nothing of the kind. One cannot judge of crime with ready-made opinions. Its philosophy is a little more complicated than people think. It is acknowledged that neither convict prisons nor the hulks. No, that's right. And that's the bit that I, I, I read earlier. And that's what we were talking about earlier, breaking up the ship. Exactly. And I think the problem is that, I mean, he, and he's saying this is really all for naught, this whole thing. And I think it's because these men, women enter prison with whatever has happened or whatever they've committed, whatever more moral world they're in is inside of their soul. And here they are going into a quote unquote prison and society is imposing these external pressure on them, this external confinement, but that doesn't do anything for what's inside their soul. Yeah, there's, um, you know, there's, uh, there's oh, sure. Go ahead, Cesar. No, sorry, I, I cut you off. 
uh, just a little bit more about like the prison system and it, it talks about the problem with sentencing, you know, that you can be a man who steals an onion for a kopeck or you could kill a hundred peasants for a hundred kopecks. And that's going to be like the prison joke is you get the same thing and you should have killed more to get more while you had the time. And they will all be alike sent to hard labor, though the sentence will perhaps not be the same number of years. Degrees of punishment, however, are not very numerous, whereas different kinds of crime may be reckoned by thousands. There are as many crimes as there are characters. And I, I just think it's interesting to point out the way in which we met a solution to the crime, 10 years imprisonment, 12 years. It rare, it, it's so, it, there's so much latitude, it couldn't help but just be a, a broad brush that's missing justice. Again, I don't know if justice, I think justice is a fallacy, that concept. He says here, the criminal who has revolted against society hates it and considers himself in the right. Society was wrong, not he. Has he not, moreover, undergone his punishment? Accordingly, he is absolved. Now, he's absolved in terms of what society has found to be what absolvement is. You spent your 10 years there, you paid your dues, theoretically, or whatever those dues are. But is he, as you point out, is he really reformed? And I, and I, like I said, when I was talking about what's inside his the moral world, inside his soul. And then we can go make this into a bigger discussion and discuss why the hell this happens in the first place. We could even transition this to pedophilia in the Catholic Church. I mean, think about it. I mean, I guess because I just saw Spotlight. But my point is, is that here we are trying to instill or impress on this construct that comes out of society in order to control society, in order to keep things stable. But it doesn't. There's still wars. There were, people are still being raped and murdered. Why are we at this point? I think that you're. I think that you're right. And I was going to edge there too uh, with this. Uh, this is another quote. Um, this is. It says, "Animal insensibility carried to such a point is remarkable. Indeed, it's phenomenal." He's talking about one of the worst guys he ever met. There must have been in this case some organic defect in the man, some physical and moral monstrosity hitherto unknown to science and not simply crime. Naturally, I did not believe so atrocious a crime, but people from the same town as myself knew all the details and told me of it. The facts were so clear that it would have been madness not to accept them. And the prisoners once heard him cry out during his sleep, hold him, hold him, cut his head off, his head, his head talking about his father that he killed. You know, so there are people in the prison, oh, yeah. and I think this gets down to it, that, well, there is this thing, and it's not just simply crime, and it's a little bit more complex than bad guys, but there is awful men here. What do you do with that? Because it seems that the author or this narrator, I mean, he is reckoning new kinds of monstrosities that he's never done, and it's through other people, other men, and I think that's what's very interesting. I mean, these are some of the worst people in the world, or have committed the most monstrous acts, anyway. I think tying that back to the whole thing we talked about with flogging and the executioner and punishment, I tie it back to, well, let me just say first, like when I, when I try to like viscerally think about what it means to a, like either receive that kind of pain or inflict that kind of pain, it just, you can't do it. It's, it's, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of when I accidentally cut myself with a knife and how much that really hurts and to imagine getting hit with full strength. 3,000 times with like a wooden baton. <laughs> there's just no, there's no connection. And I think that these executioners, just in order to not be complete psychopaths, have to do some mental work that reminds me of kind of the Grand Inquisitor in the last Dostoevsky bit we read, where they sort of do this, they take up a mantle, they sort of sacrifice their humanity, but for what they consider is the betterment of society. Because otherwise, you're just a pure psychopath, right? Like, how could you inflict that kind of thing on another human being. I see a just a line here uh, on the executioner again. If the victim did not choose to cry out, his executioner, whom in other respects I should consider a good man, looked upon it as a personal offense. He meant in the first instance to inflict only a light punishment, but directly he failed to hear the habitual supplications. Your nobility, have mercy, be a father to me, let me thank God all my life. He became furious and ordered that fifty more blows should be administered, hoping thus at last to obtain the necessary cries and supplications, and at last they came. Yeah, I think that a posteriori sort of rationalization is an important phenomenon here and is, is interesting. But I also would suggest that there's something important about 
environmental conditioning too, in making extreme conditions seem normal in a way that doesn't require you to consciously decide to be a monster or something like that, but just sort of it just sort of allows you to. But isn't that all a matter of perspective? Of course it is, but is that it, yeah? If one person's normal, it's another person's extreme, right? But it's I guess what it, my point is is that uh, perspective has a lot of interplay with um, how environment shapes it and behavior is shaped by it. Yeah. And if I take what you're saying, if I get the meaning, then it would also mean that perspective itself is a changing thing so that you can be in a position as a murderer that you never imagined yourself to be in, though it happened of the occasion or in the heat of the moment, so to speak. And people can surprise themselves by you know what they do. I mean, some of these guys are thought out or are they're just going to be serial criminals. You know, other people are more understandable. So, you know, it's it's kind of hard to talk about all this specifically because whenever we apply it specifically to somebody, they're, they're all their instances, all the circumstances of their lives and all the things that count for reasons and excuses and, and everything kind of add up and you have to take it slowly. Yeah, I mean, I think that, Daniel, what you're talking about, I mean, it just brought to mind the child soldiers in Africa. And you just, you're in a situation right. and it's your life. It's and it's everything around you. Quite frankly, we all live that way all the I mean, we're not all child soldiers, we're not but we are constantly put into situations that if you take a far step back and be like, Wow, that's pretty arbitrary. <laughs> How we ended up doing this instead of anything else seems very arbitrary to me. So yeah, I agree. That's right. You wouldn't want to say those child soldiers are monsters who were born with uh, some for some sort of biological defect, right? I mean, I I would want to attribute that to their environment. Yeah, I would say that their defect is where they were born, right? <laughs> <I mean. laughs> right. Um, Bad fortune. Yeah, but why can't we say that about Jeffrey Dahmer? Because Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't forced to do the things that he was. That he did. I mean, they didn't well, come, nobody I mean, came and held a gun to his head or killed his parents and said, go eat people and leave body parts in your freezer. It's a very different situation. Well, except that I think about it this way. If you think about the stress that is being put on the child soldiers in Africa, um, that's external, that's environmental. But why couldn't that also exist inside Jeffrey Dahmer's head? Well, maybe it can. I mean, maybe we don't need a binary there. Well, you know what I mean, but external slash internal. I mean, I'm not trying to solve Jeffrey Dahmer, but I'm just trying <laughs> to understand. When it, I guess coming off of watching Spotlight, there was one scene, that, and you saw it, right, Mary? Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, you remember that scene where... Where she, the blonde reporter, goes up to that house and the man that opens the door is one of the priests that had committed the rapes. And she was shocked a little bit. It turns out that particular character is actual a real priest, obviously. And he was the one that had actually raped 130 kids in the Boston school system that he was a part of. And, I, you know, I remember thinking about that later. I'm like, that? And then think about Jeffrey Dahmer. And then even in the context of this discussion here, I mean, where... Where did that come from? Do we always look to these people who are criminals as having something wrong inside their head? I think that it's too complex to talk about in one of these phone calls <laughs> and get through. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there are actual, there are chemical imbalances, and then there are environmental situations in that they're different. And that chemical imbalance, of course, be exacerbated by environment or something else. But I can't equate Jeffrey Dahmer and a child soldier. Somehow in my head, that makes no sense. There is no equation. Obviously, it's to completely two different, completely worlds. But I understand that. I'm just saying that when we look at these prisoners and these characters in this book that Dostoevsky confronted, you start thinking about the bigger picture about how people, how they get there and what getting there does for them and for society, ultimately. There are questions about agency and intention and yes, blameworthiness. Exactly. When something's very, very distasteful and appalling, we want to find blameworthiness. We have a lot of anger and we want to direct that towards something. And it's not very satisfying to say, well, this is uh, just this person's biology. They're just a machine. They're not blameworthy at all. But I, I think that it is complicated. I mean, there's some, uh, I mean, consider like ADD, for example. I mean, there's something that may be attributable to some kind of a chemical imbalance or some sort of uh, physiological component. But the environment has also created a situation in which that is perceived as an imbalance, whereas it may not have been before in a situation where people weren't required to pay attention in the way, or they might not have had extremes and stimulus between, you know, what was going on on their television and what was going on in a 
classroom or something. It's complicated. It's very, it's very, very complicated. I feel like Dostoevsky's point would be for how he's not being sympathetic with these convicts, but not condemning them either with how they're presented. Maybe he's uh, showing the capacity for evil that we all have within us uh, that under the right environmental stimulus just comes to the forefront. I'm thinking of the uh, the little sketch of Bekluchin, I think is his name. He was the guy who shot the uh, the German stealing his wife. When he tells the story of, like, he slipped a pistol into his pocket, he wanted to scare them, and, and then it turned out that he murdered a person. There's no connection with him being like, this evil person that's been dreaming of murder his entire life. And that doesn't make him not culpable, but it's a different sort of uh, degree of criminality or evil than, than a Dahmer case where there's active planning for evil. Yeah, or even in the, like within this story. I mean, and yeah, there's so there's certainly different kinds of prisoners. You know, one who killed a guy because he committed treason and betrayed them, but he didn't do it through the right means and doing a court martial. So he got put in jail. You know, another guy was like seducing kids out to the woods and torturing them. You know, uh, you know, another guy yet might have something gone wrong in the military or some small demerit and he's just there for a few years, but going to be in the same. Well, actually, no, because the military has their own rank, but everybody's thrown in together is what I'm trying to say. And it's interesting because we're talking, I think, about two different kinds of things, though they share a pivot point. You know, we're talking about murder and uh, atrocities and evil and, and bad acts on the one hand. Um, which has a kind of internal merit. We can be disgusted with something or horrified. And then there's also the Siberian prison camp, which is an instrument to that or is a secondary or a reactionary or, I mean, who's to know? I mean, they've been growing up beside each other for so long that it's evolved. You know, it looks like the prison is answering to that other nature. And now they're influencing each other. And so whenever we talk about something that's atrocious, that's one thing. And it's quite another, though, to talk about the legality or the something that's deemed. Uh, because all the things that we deem, we you know, they might not be exactly crimes the way that we uh, imagine them. They might not be as bad uh, or... Yeah, things that were once crimes that are no longer crimes. I, I know people who went to prison for having a joint on them. Yeah, Seriously? that's incredible. With a pure will and a pure determination, I think a part of what connects all these characters is they had an unconst- a will that was unconstrained by other people in the world, and that led to their criminality. But of course, that's not a very good measure of defining a crime, because if you, you know, erase your will completely, you're not a person. Quote here that just says, any self-will display of personality is considered a crime. Yeah, I think there's a lot to that. I mean, especially, yeah, there's, because, you know, it talks about all of the individual prisoners who have, you know, their own infamy. And whenever they first get to the prison, they talk about how they kind of brag or swagger a little bit and like, oh, yeah, well, whenever the cops chase me, I put three bullets into, you know, and like they all have their stories of bravado, yet they're broken in time (laughs) by the larger swarm of the state, I suppose. I mean, it must be an organism of the state and consequently the pieces are the prisoners. And so they, you know, ratchet everybody else into line. And then before you know it, everybody's walking around like ostensibly, you know, good organized men. Yeah. I mean, the the state apparatus, you know, is, is ratcheting up. It's, it's, gaining momentum and efficiency and any system it seems like always views itself as the fundamental entity you know so it's its constituents are not the fundamental entities and if you go around thinking that you are the ends you know and not serving the efficiency of the system then you're going to find yourself at odds if you value conformity and you value the efficiency of the system then you're not going to be deviant you're going to be uh, rewarded you're going to find that you have, by going with the flow, a lot more. You're you're very, very free as long as you're doing what the system wants you to do. Well, now we're talking about society again, right? Um, I think that there's, we, we, we kind of, we kind of been touching on this, that there's, you know, a little bit of a, there's a balance between the structure of society, whether it's in, you know, the class institutions or a prison. And there's something uh, here that Dostoevsky said, uh, that he experienced one form of suffering, which is perhaps the sharpest, the most painful that can be experienced in a house of detention, cut off from law and liberty. I mean, forced association. Association with one's fellow men is to some extent forced everywhere and always, but nowhere is it so horrible as in a prison, where there are men with whom no one would consent to live. I am certain that every convict, unconsciously perhaps, 
has suffered from this. <laughs> that was the, one of the parts that made me think. Yeah, 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 yeah that, exactly, exactly, right. I mean, that's a job. You know what I mean? The forced <laughs> yeah. association of uh, people that you yeah. don't want to be with. Don't you think that that some of those forced associations are sort of a necessary component of a healthy society, right? I mean, because it's through that exposure to adversity and difference and variety that you get a sort of healthy immune system. It calms those fears of, you know, the other in the abstract by making them concrete realities, concrete people. Like here, for instance, you know, a lot of the brick and mortar places have shut down in favor of online things. And and like what the Michael Sandel guy talks about, you know, with the skyboxing and things like that, we have all these ways that we can separate ourselves off and do our interactions in artificial sorts of ways or distanced ways now. And I think that that does rob us of the encounter. I think cell phones have done that more than just about anything else. I mean, besides losing the, the whole brick and mortar experience. But the th- but I get upset. I walk in my neighborhood a lot and walking on these streets that are, you know, they're not crowded at all. This is it's neighborhood streets and you're walking and it's it's really beautiful. There are parks and incredible trees, beautiful gardens and stuff. And there's just there's one other person who's walking toward you, toward me and they're on their phone. It's like, we're not going to have this encounter, which would just have been good morning. That's all it would have been. It would have been a smile and a good morning. But they have taken the that experience away from both of us by being on their phone. So, you know, or you go to the grocery store and passing someone in the in the aisle is no longer an experience of like, oh, you know, like kind of a smile, like, oh, I'm going to try not to bash into your cart kind of thing. Nothing. It's there. They are somewhere else. They are with someone else. They're passing me and I am not part of their experience. I am just a telephone pole or a garbage can in the way that you have to walk around. It's really distressing. In other words, they're avoiding the association. Yeah. There's something traumatic about other people. And I mean, I guess right now it's easy to get uh, get around other people with, like you said, cell phones, online shopping. If you're a computer programmer, you don't even have to work with other people. You can (laughs) sit at your desk and do that. It's replaced arbitrary encounters with search. So (laughs) you know what you want. You go for that. And you don't have to see even anything you find disagreeable, unless, of course, your fetish is being angry, and then you see only things that disagreeable. <laughs> if you look at it, if you go all the way out, go all the way to the education system that we have now, where our, our universities are basically trade schools. You don't have to read the whole newspaper, just have something send you the articles that you're interested in. And we're applying this to the construct of the prison. Well, think about it in this novel. I mean, he goes in, you know, knowing that these, he's going to be around some of the worst guys some of the worst guys in the world, some of the most feared people. And he finds ways, you know, to relate, you know, by being forced into these associations. It, this in, It's an ecosystem that he actually finds, even though he's alienated in a lot of places, he does make relationships with some people that are like as dear to him as anybody in his life has ever been. Yeah, the humanity that the book shows in the prisoners and the the life that they lead was one of my favorite parts of the book. I mean, comparing it to the stereotypical image I have of prison life, which is, you know, you got to watch out for not getting shanked or, you know, got to have gang fights all the time. Like, it's just not that, you know? (laughs) I don't think that that's totally (laughs) off. (laughs) Go in and beat the shit out of the biggest guy. All I know about prison is, like, when I get there, I got to join a gang and, you know, sharpen (laughs) it. Horses are. I would. I would not do well in prison. I can. No, we, yeah, no. We'll, we'll just make sure that never happens. Yes, <laughs> I've. I have tried in the past to figure out how a lot, like how much of a sentence would I like? How long before I was just like, yeah, fuck it, I'm just going to kill myself before I have to go in. Two years, five years. Like, how long could I? Do I actually think now I could last? It would not be long. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, I've often wondered if there's any way I could just jump straight to the solitary confinement bit. (laughs) (laughs) If I could just get, you know, some kind of like library to come by and some meals, you know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be really fancy, you know, just some standing room. I don't mean to uh, to glorify it, but I am interested in the community, especially with all the work that the prisoners do in their spare time, like 
well, this is modern now, but you hear about people getting their law degree or, you know, learning how to, you know, be a uh, psychologist or something. But, you know, all of these men were also learning how to do just incredible amounts of, uh, of craftsmanship, gilding things, you know. Um, I mentioned that before. Well, they're all, I mean, in this one, there are, are all men. I mean, I'm, yeah, there weren't many men and women in this one. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, they all got killed by their husbands. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But he was very clear that excessive work, like Nathan quoted before, was something that drove the men to a bad place. But And that they needed to do right. it. And it was illegal, but they wanted to do it. Yes, it's tied up in the idea of hope and, for one, just liberation at the end of it. But you mentioned the Christmas scene in the book, Mary. And it was looked forward to all year. And then the way it's described in the book, falls apart people spend all their money and get drunk but it's kind of a sad drunk it's kind of like it didn't quite reach the expectations that they were setting on it all year and it just it's a rinse and repeat cycle it's part of never actually attaining that hope that you that you see and the hope in the events it reminds me of like a bad party where everybody's sitting around and trying to get drunk and make something happen but <laughs> it's just not working out <laughs> That's funny. I think you really put your finger on the phenomenon there. <laughs> yeah. Because I know when you say a bad party, I know exactly the feeling that you're talking about. It's like it's missing that ingredient that makes everybody sort of forget that they're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> waiting for something to happen in their lives. Right. There was it made me I thought a couple times of I don't know if anybody else has ever seen or read uh, Eugene O'Neill's The Iceman Cometh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought about that because, you know, in that one, you've got all these guys in a bar and they're all down and outs and they're all, they have these separate illusions. They have these separate pipe dreams. And this guy comes in and he convinces them all that what they need to do is shatter those illusions and live their real lives. And what you find out is that the illusions were actually what were keeping these guys going. That was sort of resonant with me in this story as well, because, you know, the dream of freedom, you know, is sort of what gets him through. And then, you know, even though, you know, from the beginning, like we talked about earlier, that it's not going to end well for him. But that pipe dream is sort of what motivates him, what, you know, galvanizes his energy. I don't think it's going to end well for any of them. We all have a personal apocalypse. Yeah, right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but I think entering this construct of the prison for anybody is thankfully, okay, hope is there. I'm shocked if it is. If you think about what prisoners go through now and then in Siberia and anywhere, I just think that it, it's doomed totally. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we all just pop a pill? And, you know, <laughs> Laura, what did you have for end, breakfast? End it now. But I mean, I, don't, I was thinking about it. Like, what were they doing before we really had? Prior to Rome, in prehistoric times, when the man ape stole somebody's food, they were killed. Right? They were killed. So that was their little society's response to when you break a rule or you do something that is against someone else. This is going to be the response. I just feel like it, that's evolved, 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 and we have this big society. We have all these constructs, these laws, these structures, and it's still not something that is adequately dealt with because this is the human condition. It's tones of Nietzsche with uh, with yeah. our laws having just buckets of yeah. blood behind them, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> Even thinking about Spotlight and that whole idea of pedophilia priests, more wars in, in history have been fought in the name of the church. It's just, to me, this ingrained fact in the human condition that is never, ever, ever going to be fixed. <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah. You know, whenever someone says that more wars have been fought in the name of the church, you know, it didn't have anything to do with the church other than it being an institution that wanted more shit. Like every other war that's ever been fought. I would say that war is almost always fought for greed. Almost for always. Yeah. It's just, a, yeah. And I don't think that, that religion has anything. I mean, there may be zealots among the, the fighting uh, masses. People aren't fighting for No, but I, th God. I think what it is, is that there's this, this icon set up in the church and has been since very early on because we've always turned towards the Jesus figure or the or the you know, flag or, or anything <laughs> right we turn toward these icons for hope and and as a savior but the problem is that we built these institutions around that hence the church and the government and they are populated by humans humans create it humans populate it and then they destroy it and they destroy each other We're you know really good at that and they abuse kids I mean it's just 
I'm sorry. I'm just really freaked out about everything right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of hope, I was. I, I wonder if any of you know the whole the whole poem that Pindar poem about hope. That something in it that says that it chiefly guides the wayward minds of mortals. It's just something that stayed with me forever. It's just that that one line that you know, hope the old man's nursemaid who chiefly guides the wayward minds of the mortals. But so is the subtext there kind of like what uh, I guess I was getting at with the Eugene O'Neill thing? Like yeah, just hope leads you astray. But it also is what you live. For. <laughs> if you have no hope, you have no will right. to live. That's it. Nothing is ever so perfect that you have no hope for change, for something different or something new or whatever. Your life is never that perfect. Well, it's got to be there to get up the next morning. I got a last paragraph on, on that. Here it is. Now, what sort of psychological operation had been going on in that man's soul? No man lives, can live, without having some object in view and making efforts to attain that object. But when object there is none and hope is entirely fled, anguish often turns a man into a monster. The object we all had in view was liberty and getting out of our place of confinement and hard labor. So I try to place our convicts in separately defined Dane classes and categories, but it cannot be well done. Reality is a thing of infinite diversity and defies the most ingenious deductions and definitions of abstract thought. Nay, abhors the clear and precise classifications we so delight in. Reality tends to infinite subdivision of things, and truth is a matter of infinite shadings and differentiations. Every one of us who were there had his own peculiar interior strictly personal life, which lay altogether outside of the world of regulations and of our official superintendents. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I need to find that and write that down somewhere. <laughs> That was one of the things that's so great about Dostoevsky that actually really still was present in this book is his keen sense for psychology and the minute differences between people. And, and also, you know, the attitudes that we share, he, he, he's able to describe them and get them down in a way that you immediately know, like the kind of mood or approach to the world that he's talking about when he brings it up. Yeah. I'm wondering if, if uh, people want to do favorite lines. Okay. I'll jump in. This is talking about the winter. I mentioned it. Um, and this is before they had the work to do. And this is just them going to sleep at night earlier than usual. At least four hours passed before everyone was asleep. And until then, there was a tumult of laughter and oaths, rattling of chains, and a poisonous atmosphere. Thick smoke, a confusion of shaved heads, branded foreheads, clothes that were filthy rags. Yes, man is a pliable animal. He must be so defined. A being who grows accustomed to everything. That would be perhaps the best definition that could be given of him. Very nice. Laura, do you have one? Uh, yes, I just have one line. He is as a limb cut off from the body of mankind and cast aside. I have one from Christmas. This is about a man who was a somewhat simple minded person who has kept a, has kept a suit of clothing for four months in his trunk and prepares the night before, tries it on and everything and to make sure that it's perfect for Christmas day. He's one of the people who <laughs> actually got a sucking pig. One of the buttons alone seemed out of place. Akim Akimich noticed it and at once made the necessary alteration. He tried on the coat once more and found it irreproachable. I remembered in reading that last sentence how much I love Dostoevsky, that he can say that a coat is irreproachable, that the way a coat's look is irreproachable, and it made me so happy. <laughs> Later on in that same section, he writes, I do not know why, but hay was always strewed on the ground at Christmas time. And I was surprised that he asked because Jesus, manger, straw, hay. I didn't understand why he actually said it because it's, to me, it's so obvious, but maybe it wasn't obvious in Russia at the time. It just seems so odd to me. Like, what is he, what's he doing there? No, but I get what you're saying now. That didn't occur to me. But, and I would have thought, you know, manger, those are the, those are kind of my first thoughts. I'm still not sure about it. And I'm wondering if I'm, you know, there's more to guess at. All right. I'm going to read this one about the eagle because I liked it. When he saw nobody and thought he was alone, he ventured upon leaving his corner and limping along the palisade for a dozen steps or so, then went back and forwards and backwards, precisely as if he were taking exercise for his health under medical orders. As soon as ever he caught sight of me, he made for his corner as quickly as he possibly could, limping and hopping. Then he threw his head back, opened his mouth, ruffled himself, and seemed to make ready for a fight. In vain I tried to caress him. He bit and struggled as soon as he was touched. 
Not once did he take the meat I offered him, and all the time I remained by him he kept his head he kept his wicked piercing eye upon me, lonely and revengeful, he waited for death, defying, refusing to be reconciled with everything and everybody. He's just steadfastly insisting upon being his own being and not the eagle for them, you know, the pet for them, the thing in their day. But uh, even if it means distress and torture in his end, he's going to insist on being disagreeable and just assert his own identity. <laughs> 